Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again, and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. In the summer of 1947, people across the United States and around the world were captivated by the news of possible alien activity in the desert of New Mexico. According to reports, an unidentified flying disc had crashed near a ranch, strewing debris across the ground. Rumors quickly spread that life forms from outer space had landed on Earth and were being kept hidden by the U.S. military at a top-secret facility. Both the exact nature of the crash site, as well as the debris reportedly found, were kept highly confidential. The public's imagination ran wild. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. For many years afterwards, Ufologists and conspiracy theorists continue to insist that the incident was a government cover-up. I am, of course, talking about the Roswell incident, named for the New Mexico town near where the crash occurred. Skeptics continue to try and debunk the incident, but some believers continue to harbor doubts. If aliens had actually crashed outside Roswell, then apparently they were not satisfied with visiting only the U.S. In late 1980, it was rumored that UFOs had decided to make their next destination the United Kingdom, visiting two Air Force bases under U.S. operation just outside Rendlesham Forest in the southeast of England. What happened next was captured by the U.S. Air Force and security personnel not only in written documents, but also in audio recordings, which makes for compelling listening. So much so, the story was dubbed the British Roswell. My name is Eric Crosby. Welcome to True. Around 3 a.m. on December 26, 1980, U.S. security personnel near the east gate of Royal Air Force Base Woodbridge were going about their regular duties. Suddenly, the patrol members saw bright lights coming from the nearby Rendlesham Forest, immediately east of the base. Sergeant Jim Penniston and Airman Edward Cabanseg and John Burroughs set out into the forest. The team was concerned that they had witnessed a plane crash, but as they made their way through the dark with only their flashlights, Penniston saw something that made him realize they were not dealing with a downed plane. Above the trees, he saw a large yellow light, and beneath it, a red blinking light and a steady blue light. He noted that the object producing the light was mechanical. The airmen got about 50 yards away from the object, but as they approached it, it moved in a zigzag motion through the trees. Cabansag and Burroughs also both saw the colored lights, and one of the airmen reported hearing strange noises, like a woman was screaming, followed by nearby farm animals becoming disturbed. They did not, however, see the source of the lights. The team continued to follow the lights through the woods, walking an estimated two miles. 
as they approached the edge of the forest, they saw a bright lighthouse five miles off in the distance. The search was terminated, and the airmen proceeded to walk back to their vehicle. On the way, Peniston saw the blue light streak by again, but just for a few seconds. The three airmen all submitted statements about what they saw on their watch, and Peniston provided a hand-drawn diagram of the forest and the potential object he saw amongst the trees. But there were significant differences between their descriptions. Both Peniston and Burroughs described the multicolored lights, but were not able to determine their source. But Kabansag was confident that the light they saw came from the lighthouse and that nothing else of note occurred. The next morning, servicemen returned to the clearing where the airmen had seen the lights. On the ground were three small impressions in the form of a triangle, like something had potentially landed there. Pine trees in the immediate vicinity had broken branches and evidence of what appeared to be burn marks. Local police were skeptical about the impressions and suggested the divots were likely left by animals and the tree markings were created by foresters to mark trees ready to be cut down. That could have been where the story ended, three airmen potentially confusing a lighthouse for something more otherworldly and maybe some rabbit scratchings in a clearing. But the next night, December 27th, the strange events of Rendlesham Forest continued. At around 9.30 p.m., security patrol officers from RAF Woodbridge interrupted an officer's Christmas party. Lieutenant Bruce Englund is believed to have said the foreboding words to his superior, quote, The UFO is back. Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt left the party and went into the forest to investigate with Englund. They were joined by Sergeant Bobby Ball, Sergeant Monroe Nevels, and Sergeant Penniston. The group was armed with an audio recorder, and Halt captured 18 minutes and 12 seconds of the men's adventure in the forest. The tape could only hold 20 minutes, so he stopped and started the recording many times over a period of hours to ensure he didn't run out of space. The tape documents the conversations between Colonel Halt, England, and Nevels, who was operating a Geiger counter. As they made their way through the forest, the audio captures their reactions to what's going on around them. One quick note, the audio recording you're going to hear is a copy made by Halt. It was made holding a microphone up to a speaker. Because of this, you'll sometimes hear background noises and voices from within the room. The tape begins with Colonel Halt and his men approaching the supposed landing site from the night before. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. Having a lift car, you can't get the line all the work. There seems to be some kind of mechanical problem. Let's send it back, get another light. Main cover, we're going to take some readings for the Gatter Kyer and uh, chase around the air a little bit, wait for another light off to come back in. Halt asks Nevels about the Geiger counter readings around the indentations. Okay, we're now approaching the area within about 25, 30 feet. What kind of readings are we getting? Anything? Just 500 clicks. 500 clicks. What are the impressions? There was minimal radiation around the impressions in the ground, so they decided to see what the readings were like at the center point between the indentations. We found a small blast, what looks like a blasted or scrubbed up area here. We're getting very positive readings. Let's see, is that near the center? Yes, it is. This is what we would assume would be the dead center. Up to seven tenths. Okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we make a sweep about right around the whole area, about ten foot out, and make a perimeter run around it, starting right back here at the corner. In the center of the indentations, the men found a spot that they described as blasted or scruffed up, where they got positive radiation measurements. But at this point, the evidence was not that impressive, so Halt shut off the recorder for a while. He turned it back on when the Geiger counter started to pick up more radiation. What are we up to? 
We're up to two, three units deflection. You're getting in close to one pod. Then England noticed that the trees around the supposed landing site all had marks that pointed towards the center of the indentations. Halt had the men take samples of the abrasions on the trees, as well as measure the radiation levels. We are getting some, you're getting rains on the tree you're taking samples from on the side facing the suspected landing site. Four clicks, Max. Up to four. Interesting. That's right where you're taking the sample now. Four. That's the strongest point on the tree? Yes, sir. If you come to the back, there's no clicks whatsoever. No clicks at all on the back. It's all on the Maybe side one or two. facing the... Interesting. The indentations look like something twisted as it got, you know, as it sat down on them. It looks like someone took something and sat it down and twisted it from side to side. Mm-hmm. Very strange. If you're looking for a new true crime podcast to binge, I've got one for you. Set in Indianapolis in 1977, American Hostage is a suspenseful true story starring John Hamm as Fred Heckman, a beloved radio reporter who is thrust into the middle of a life or death crisis when a hostage taker, Tony Karitsis, demands to be interviewed live on his popular news program. Stay tuned after this episode to hear a preview of American Hostage. Geico asks, How would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. The team continued to take heat and energy readings from around the site using a night vision device called a Starscope. They were able to find some spots that were still giving off energy readings, despite the activity at the site being almost 24 hours old. Colonel Halt drew everyone's attention upward, noting that the trees had freshly broken branches. Looking directly overhead, one can see an opening in the trees, plus some freshly uh, broken pine branches on the ground underneath. Looks like someone came off about 15 to 20 feet up, some small branches about an inch or less in diameter. He also commented that nearby animals were making some strange noises. Strange sounds out of the farmer's barnyard animals. It's very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. However, this is one of the explainable parts of the events. The nearby farm was a crop farm only and did not have any animals. It's been hypothesized that the animal noises heard by Halt and his men were muntjack deer. They can bark repeatedly and loudly and can be known to scream when frightened. Take a listen. Up until now, the men had experienced some interesting readings and saw some curious marks. Nothing that would give you confidence that Rendlesham was the next Roswell. And then England saw something in the trees. You have been a pigmentation. You just saw a light yeah, where? 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 Right on this position here, straight ahead in between the tree. There it is again. Watch straight ahead off my flash right there, yeah, sir. There it is. Hey, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. So, yeah, can I get some of Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. It looks to be out maybe a quarter to half mile, maybe further out. I'm going to switch off. The light, light is gone now. It was approximately 120 degrees from the site. Is it back again? Yes, sir. Oh, that's flashlight, sir. It's 
I'll have to be head to the clearing so I can get a better look at it. The men moved into the clearing towards the light to get a better view. On the tape, you can hear the men trying to keep an eye on it, calling out when it vanished. From their position, Halt described it as being about four feet off the ground. He noted that it was a red flashing light, but England said that he saw a yellow light. There's no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. There's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it too. Weird. According to the tape, the light started to move toward the airmen. It, it appears that he may be moving a little bit this way. It's, it's brighter than it has been. Yellow. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. Pieces of it are shooting off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. To the left. Yeah, definitely moving no, right. Two, two lights. Two one light to the right, one light to the left. Keep the flashlights off. There's something very, very strange. Get the headset on. See if it gets any stronger. The airmen approached the edge of the forest, where they were able to get a clear look at the light. Okay, we're looking at the thing. We're probably about two to three hundred yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you. It's still moving from side to side. And when you put the star scope on it, it, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark center. It's, it's you know, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. And the flash is so bright to the star scope that uh, it almost burns your eye. The men continued through the farmer's fields, keeping an eye on the lights. Now we have multiple sightings of up to five lights with a similar shape and all, but they seem to be steady now rather than a pulsating or glow with a red flash. Just after 3 a.m., an hour and 15 minutes after the light was first spotted, Halt continued to describe what he saw. I've seen strange lights in the sky. At 2.44, we're at the far side of the farmer's, the second farmer's field and made sighting again about 110 degrees. This looks like it's clear out to the coast. It's right on the horizon. Moves about a bit and flashes from time to time. Still steady or red in color. Also, after negative readings in the center of the field, we're picking up uh, slight readings, uh, four or five clicks now on the meter. 3.05, we see strange uh, strobe-like flashes to the uh, rather sporadic, but there's definitely something, uh, some kind of phenomenal. 3.05, at about uh, 10 degrees horizon uh, directly north, we've got two strange objects, uh, half-moon shape, dancing about with colored lights on them. But uh gets to be about five to ten miles out, maybe less. The half moons have now turned into full circles. As long as there was a elip- eclipse or something there for a minute or two. Zero three fifteen now we've got an object about ten degrees directly south, ten degrees off the horizon. And the ones in the north are moving one's moving away from us. Moving out fast. This one on the right away too. Yeah, we're both heading north. Okay, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Only minutes later, a beam of light shoots from one of the lights to the ground. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Fifteen minutes later, Halt noted that one of the lights appeared to be losing altitude, but continued to beam lights to the ground. 30 and the objects are still in the sky, although the one to the side looks like it's losing a little bit of altitude. We're turning around and heading back toward uh, the base. At 4 a.m., he recorded his last post of the evening. Zero hundred hours, one object still hovering over Woodbridge Base at about 5 to 10 degrees off the horizon, still moving erratic and similar lights and beaming down as earlier. In January 1981, A full two weeks after the sightings, Colonel Halt documented what he saw in a memo to the UK Ministry of Defense. It included the details he captured in his recording, including the three lights that were visible for a few hours, hovering about 10 degrees above the horizon, and periodically emitting beams of light to the ground. The ministry reviewed the incident, but decided not to take any further investigative action on the basis that it didn't appear to pose any threat to national security. The memo and the signed statements from the airmen were filed away, and the event was basically forgotten. Unlike the events at Roswell, however, what happened at Rendlesham Forest was not classified. 
The memo was released two years later, in 1983, under the U.S. Freedom of Information Act, and immediately captured the imagination of UFO lovers everywhere. Newly declassified documents about UFOs will be scrutinized by scientists and fanatics alike. Amongst the 4,000 pages, previously unseen documents relating to Britain's Roswell. The sightings were all considered extremely unusual by those who witnessed them, but it wasn't long before skeptics were looking for alternative, if much less exciting, explanations. Famous astronomy writer, broadcaster, and self-proclaimed UFO skeptic Ian Ridpath has spent significant time debunking the Rendlesham Forest mystery, and if you want to fully go down that rabbit hole, check out his detailed analysis at his website, ianridpath.com. Taking apart each aspect piece by painstaking piece, he notes that the entire event started with the airmen seeing a bright light descending into Rendlesham Forest at 3 a.m. on December 26th. Coincidentally, a large and incredibly bright meteor called a fireball was witnessed falling to Earth around 2.50 a.m., plus or minus five minutes, that same day. The meteor was reported by the British Astronomical Association, and years after the event, a security guard from one of the U.S. military bases said that he witnessed it as well. His name was Bertolino, and in a 2009 interview on the podcast Earth Files, he said that he saw, quote, a very bright falling star. It had a blue-green luminescence, sparkle tail to it. He then said he heard someone on the military radio yelling, quote, there's a UFO out here. Ian Ridpath agrees with local police who were on the scene the night of the incident that the flashing lights seen between the trees was likely the nearby lighthouse, the same one the airmen had noted in their statements. This particular lighthouse was one of the brightest in the country and flashed at five-second intervals, roughly the same gap in time between the blinking lights that Penniston noted in his report. Also, two miles up the coast from the lighthouse were several radio towers with distinctive red lights. Another author and skeptic, Brian Dunning, evaluated the mountain of evidence in 2009 in his podcast, Skeptoid. He spoke of the importance of analyzing each separate piece of evidence on its own merit to assess whether each point could survive scientific scrutiny. He said, quote, The meteors had nothing to do with the lighthouse or the rabbit diggings, but when you hear all three stories told together, it's easy to conclude, as did the airmen, that the light overhead became an alien spacecraft in the forest. He concluded, quote, Always remember, separate pieces of poor evidence don't aggregate together into a single piece of good evidence. His story now being torn apart by skeptics, Colonel Halt felt so strongly about what he'd witnessed that 30 years later, in June 2010, he signed an affidavit detailing his experience. But this time, Halt went further. His descriptions were significantly more embellished but the description in the affidavit was different than what was in the original memo or on the tapes. For example, in the affidavit, he wrote about three lights in the northern sky, when he originally only mentioned two. He also described them moving across the sky, quote, at high speed in sharp, angular patterns as though they were doing a grid search, which was much more descriptive than the word erratic that he had used on the tapes. Halt described in the affidavit a round, bright object in the southern sky that moved toward them rapidly. It stopped overhead and shot down a beam of light about a foot in diameter, similar to a laser beam, that hit the ground about 10 feet in front of the airmen. The light was then said to move towards the military base, continuing to send down laser beams. One of the beams landed near the weapons storage area, which, years later, was confirmed to have contained nuclear bombs. Halt said that he heard chatter on the radio that other airmen had seen the beams. In his recordings and original memo, he had only mentioned the beams of light in passing, and no other airmen have ever stepped forward to provide witness. In the affidavit, Halt accused both the UK and US governments of covering up extraterrestrial activity and withholding documentation about what had occurred at Rendlesham. He said, quote, I believe the objects I saw at close quarters were extraterrestrial in origin and that the security services of both the United States and the United Kingdom have attempted, both then and now, to subvert the significance of what occurred at Rendlesham Forest and RAF Bentwaters by use of well-practiced methods of disinformation. His story continued to grow. 
Years later, when walking through Rendlesham Forest with a UFO researcher, Halt was captured on video saying that Burroughs may have been abducted. He said, quote, He may have been abducted. Who knows? I don't play that up. You know, there is lost time. We know that. He also said, You've got men in the forest that you can't... Uh, unaccounted for hours. Are you going to call for backup and send them or you out there? The fact that key aspects of Halt's affidavit and later descriptions directly contradict both his original memo and the audio recording has not been lost on many skeptics. This includes his former base commander, Colonel Ted Conrad, who debriefed both Halt and Sergeant Penniston in the days after the incident. Conrad was unequivocal in his criticism of Halt's claims, later telling professor and investigative journalist Dr. David Clark, quote, Halt can believe as he wishes. I've already disputed, to some degree, what he reported. However, he should be ashamed and embarrassed by his allegation that his country and England both conspired to deceive their citizens over this issue. He knows better. But it's not just Halt who continues to question what happened in the forest that night. In recent years, Sergeant Penniston has publicly claimed that he not only saw something mechanical, but that he spent 45 minutes in its presence. He described the outside of the craft like smooth, opaque black glass that was covered in markings, similar to ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. While near the craft, he said that he received a message, telepathically, in binary code, which he captured in his notebook the next day, 12 to 14 pages of ones and zeros. He described it as a download of information that kept churning in his mind until he wrote it all down. Under hypnosis, he said the message was from humans in the future, time travelers. Oh, it absolutely was telepathic. Uh, it wasn't like I could see it in front of me, like visually. It was, it was like it was a, uh, a pictorial that was running a movie in my in my uh, brain. You know, it, it was it wasn't it was a mind's eye kind of thing. Burroughs, the other airman who witnessed the lights that first night, claims that what he witnessed was definitely not a meteor. He recently published a book entitled Weaponization of Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, in which he outlines his belief that what he saw was military experiments harnessing energy in the forest. In a BBC article, he said that what he saw was some sort of energy or plasma, which could be a form of intelligence. However, Burroughs recently suffered a heart issue that rarely happens to men his age. He wondered whether it could have been brought on by what happened in the forest so he requested his medical records from the military. But he was unable to access them because they had been classified. He was able to find documents showing high levels of radiation at the supposed landing site, and based on this, the U.S. military paid for his medical bills. His lawyers have stated that this is effectively an admission that UFOs are real. As one UFO fan said, quote, in granting John Burroughs full disability for his injuries in Rendlesham Forest, the U.S. government has, by de facto, acknowledged the existence of unidentified aerial phenomena. The latest attempt to debunk the Rendlesham UFO surfaced in 2018. Supposedly, the lights on both nights were simply a prank engineered by the SAS against the U.S. Air Force. An individual claiming to be an SAS insider, known as Frank, stated that they wanted to get even after being interrogated when they accidentally parachuted onto the U.S. base. Frank claimed that in December, the SAS attached lights and flares to black helium balloons and sent these via remote control to the bases at Woodbridge and Bentwaters. This would have been an ironic end for a UFO story that's gripped Britain for 30 years, but it was quickly debunked, and the true story is still unknown. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. 
He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die, too. These people don't have anything to lose, and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor signs for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The British Forestry Commission have smartly capitalized on the legend and established the UFO Trail, complete with an artist's interpretation of the craft and markings at the landing site. The brochure for the trail has a disclaimer that says, quote, The content of and views expressed in this leaflet are in no way an expression of the beliefs or understanding of the Forestry Commission. Believers continue to flock to Rendlesham Forest, but for anyone who wants to see for themselves, England's Roswell awaits. After all, the truth is out there. True is a production of Imperative Entertainment. This episode of True was researched and written by Gemma Harris. The executive producer is Jason Hoke of Imperative Entertainment. The cover art and design were created by Jenna Sullivan. True was created and is produced by me. Have any comments or questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. A huge thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another episode. As promised, here's a preview of American Hostage. And while you're listening, follow American Hostage wherever you get your podcasts, or you can binge all eight episodes right now on Amazon Music. This podcast is based on a true story. He says he had been planning this for four years, according to my information here. Did he come in with a shotgun? Evidently, he made a bad real estate deal and he's going to settle it. It looks like we're going to be here quite a long time. Good afternoon. I'm Fred Heckman with WIBC. Tuesday, February 8th, 1977. For me, there are three tenets of journalism. One, don't make it personal. Two, don't pick a side. And three, don't become the story. I broke all three of those in the span of a single phone call. Hello, WIBC. This is really Fred Heckman. Yes. <laughs> we got something developed in downtown. Something developed. You're going to help me straighten this out for me, Mr. Heckman. You want an interview? Yes. The WIBC News Division speaking directly to the hostage taker is a disaster. What they're doing right now is character assassination. If he doesn't trust the system. He's a psychopath. He needs an outlet. You can't go down. He does have a background at explosion. Yeah. Anything you say, anything you do, you get this guy's head blown off. Every hour that goes by, the hostage becomes less of a person, less of a human. Do you have a wife and family, Fred? I sure do, Toby. Let's say somebody said, we're going to take your car, we're going to take your house, we're going to take your wife, we're going to take your children. Would you be ready to kill Heckman? Well, I, 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 Would you be ready to kill Heckman? I'd be awfully mad, sir. American Hostage is an Amazon original and criminal content production starring John Hamm. Follow American Hostage wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can binge all eight episodes right now on Amazon Music and Wondery+. Plus. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again. And that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor signs for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it.
From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.